Thank you for the uh, welcome. It's nice to turn around now and see who's here. There was a number of people welcoming me as I arrived, and uh, I always appreciate that. I love that window. You, you don't get to see it that much, do you? So, wow. Very, very good, yeah. Um, I did go to Spurgeon's College, which he just said, so we did get something wrong. They always say you can always tell somebody who's uh, been to Spurgeon's, but you can't tell him much. That's what they usually say. But I didn't go there. I'll tell you where I went in a few moments. Um, but I did know uh, Charles from uh, Kettering. Uh, Charles, uh, I think he grew up in the church where I was minister, Fuller Baptist Church in Kettering. Uh, but he, uh, he, was, he, he got independent, basically, so he, he ran an independent fellowship there. But he used to join us on a Thursday evening for badminton. He and Rachel he used to come along. And uh, I was tempted to bring some photos along so you could see it's not been easy. If you haven't seen it, it's not been easy. He used to throw himself all over the place in badminton, um, usually with not a lot of success when he was throwing himself. <laughs> Downstairs in another large hall uh, was his mother. Uh, she was there with the Choral Society, the Kettering Choral Society. And I don't know if she knew that the noise that was coming from upstairs was her son throwing himself around, but he uh, used to. Uh, I think he used to disturb them sometimes, so we all do as we run around playing badminton in better days. You can see now that I haven't played badminton uh, for quite a while, and, uh, but, but Charles still uh, kept his slim-ish figure and obviously kept himself fit. I'm sorry that I missed him here, but uh, obviously he knew there was a possibility of me bringing those photographs, so he decided to disappear back to Romans <laughs> and North Africa. When I first go to a church, I usually, uh, if you don't mind, just take a few moments just to uh, let you know who I am, so, because I'm a total stranger uh, to you as far as uh, you're aware. So just know a little bit about me and uh, then we'll get into God's Word, which is the real reason why I'm here. I'm a retired minister now, I've been retired four years. Uh, we're living in Pilsley near Chesterfield, not the posh one near Chatsworth, uh, but the one near Clay Cross. I always say we've got Dennis Skinner. For our MP. I don't think Chaps would have got Dennis Skinner for their MP. So we're living in a house uh, which Christy, my wife and I are renting, courtesy of the Retired Baptist Ministers Housing Society, a very nice house that uh, they provided for us. I originate from Nottingham. I was brought up as a child on a council estate three miles north of Nottingham near Bullwell. I was born in Bullwell and uh, brought up on the Westwood estate uh, near Nottingham. I used to attend a Methodist church there, and my parents were very involved. So I come basically from a Methodist family, uh, but in my mid to late teens, I started going to Queensbury Baptist Church uh, in Baseford, and I was later <coughs> baptised there appropriately uh, on the day of the Westcliffe conversion, 24th of May. But in my case, it was 1971, the year of decimalisation. That's how I remember the year that I was uh, baptised. In 1972-73, uh, we moved over to Beeston and started worshipping at the local Baptist church in Beeston. I started my working life uh, working for the South Knox Coal Board Laboratories. I worked at Cinder Hill and Sherwood Lodge, and then later I moved over to the opposition to the Central Electricity Generating Board uh, at Nottingham Power Station and then at Ratcliffe and uh, at Spondon, or we used to call it Despondon because it was a depressing place to work. We didn't make electricity, we just made steam for uh, Saladines next door. During my time at Despondon, uh, I believe God was calling me to full-time ministry, which was a bit of a surprise, because when I was at Queensbury, I used to be known as the young man who sat at the back and nearly tripped the minister up, trying to get out before him, <laughs> uh, so I didn't have to speak to anybody. Now I find myself at the front of a church, but I uh, resisted that call for some time and eventually um, said yes to the Lord and uh, I trained uh, not at Spurgeon's but at St John's College near Nottingham at Bramcourt, uh, an Anglican college but an evangelical Anglican college and I knew that uh, Peter Nodding at uh, West Bridgeford uh, Baptist Church had already been there and trained for the Baptist ministry so I went there because it was local basically and I'd got a, a family. So I trained to be a Baptist minister, I've been brought up as a Methodist trained to be a Baptist minister at an Anglican college. Somebody once said that I'm the World Council of Churches rolled into one. I've served in three Baptist churches, one in Leicester 
And then the Lord graciously took us down to Western Supermare for eight years. And, uh, and if you don't think the sea comes in very far there, I've seen it uh, with sandbags at the end of my road. So it does sometimes come in uh, quite a way. Uh, and then we moved uh, for 17 years. We were in Kettering in Northamptonshire uh, prior to retirement. I uh, served there at Fuller Baptist Church, right in the heart, in the centre of Kettering, next to Boots the Chemist, that kind of position there. And so while I was there, I spent a lot of time developing and trying to communicate a vision for town centre ministry and mission in that setting. So we tried to uh, regard the shops in the shopping centre as our community and our neighbours and try to connect with them. Now my wife Christine and I are thoroughly enjoying retirement. It's a bit it doesn't come earlier in life, it's great. And uh, we're enjoying it and maintaining what I usually call a controlled busyness. I'm not one of these ministers who said I'm busier now than I was when I was in ministry. I do a lot of gardening. Um, I've studied uh, Royal Horticultural Society exams for gardening and, and done that, so I've tried to have a balanced sort of life, but I come out uh, about twice a month uh, preaching uh, because I believe God has called me to preach and to serve in this way. We've got four children, if you can call them children. Uh, the youngest is 34 years old now, so I've got three boys and one girl. I've got six grandchildren, ranging in ages from 22 down to five, I guess the youngest one is, so I've got a range of grandchildren, and uh, I have to confess we worship at the parish church in our village. It's a very low church, uh, it's not ideal, and we get quite frustrated with them uh, at times uh, as the local church, but uh, we felt we needed to be part of the community, the worshipping community in our own village, and in the space of four years that's helped us to have a sense of belonging to the village. I share in leadership a weekly home group which we hold at our house and so it's an opportunity to uh, get something of scripture across these Anglicans and to teach them things that somewhere they've never learnt uh, on their way, their journey of faith. So that's basically about me, it's obviously not the whole story. I tell you how the story ends so far. I end up standing in a church in Sunday Nashville yeah, yeah. and uh, preaching. So that's all I can tell you so far. That's where it ends so far. As we come to God's word, let's pray. Our Father God, we do thank you for the privilege of being able to come together freely in this nation to worship you. And we thank you for this time in the midst of the busyness of the week, this oasis where we can come we can be quiet, sometimes even just with our own thoughts, uh, but we can be quiet in your special presence and together we can think about you, we can praise you, we can read your word and uh, we can discern what you're saying to us. So Father, we pray this morning that you will help us now as we think further about your word to us. Help us, inspire us as we listen and as we think. May your spirit take your word and... Uh, Help us to understand its meaning and how it works out in practice in our own lives. Lord, we pray that it will inspire each of us, both myself speaking and each of us listening, so that your written word may become for us the living word, which we can put into action during this coming week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> We're going to turn in a few moments to the book of Isaiah, but uh, in the uh, book of Isaiah from chapters 40 onwards, there's a sort of section from chapter 40 to, 40, uh, to 55, and uh, in this chapter there's a theme that runs through about the Lord's servant. And this theme comes to prominence in these verses. It's a theme that develops as you move through those chapters. Sometimes the Lord's servant seems to be the whole nation of Israel. Sometimes the Lord's servant is Cyrus, the Persian king. He's called God's servant. Sometimes it looks like a group of faithful people within the nation, the righteous remnant, as Isaiah puts it. But as the theme develops, the Lord's servant begins to look like an individual. And certain passages show this very clearly. These passages together are called the servant songs. 
These are descriptions of what it means to be God's servant. God's servant, that's a task. Originally intended for his chosen nation, for the Jews, but through their failure to serve God in the way that he intended, it's a task that became focused on one individual at a moment of history, the individual, of course, being Jesus Christ. And then the task of the servant starts to expand again through a new Israel, the Christian church. We are the new Israel. And so it focused in and then it started to expand. Could, uh, picture, if you like, an hourglass or a, an egg timer, one of those things. And there's a sense in which it was meant to be the nation. It narrowed down to a few people, then down to one individual, and then through the disciples and through the developing Christian church, right down to our own time, it's expanded again, the task of being the Lord's servant. The nation Israel, its purpose was to be a light to the nations. The purpose of Israel, the purpose of Jews, is to be a living, breathing example of what it means to live in a relationship with God, our Creator. Then it narrows down, as I say, to that faithful remnant in the Old Testament times, down to the expectant people at the time of Christ's birth, down to Jesus Christ, especially Christ there on the cross, that solitary figure. Then expanding again through the disciples, the growing number of believers, right down to today, this church, and the worldwide church. And that task remains the same. Even here in the 21st century, the Christian church has a purpose. And our purpose is to show the world, beginning on the doorstep, but to show the world what it means to live in a relationship with God our Creator through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. So we have the servant songs, First one to Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 to 4. I'm not going to read all of that. We're going to read from Isaiah 53, if you want to find the passage in the Bible. But Isaiah 42 says, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. Part of the task of the servant is to bring justice and righteousness to the nations. In Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 6, we have the second servant song, where the servant actually has been uh, a bit bothered and complaining because he's worked hard and achieved nothing. And so God, in his typical way, says, OK, I'll give you a bit more to do then. It's too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel. I'll make you a light to the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. The servant's task, a light to the Gentiles, that God's salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. The third servant song is Isaiah chapter 50. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I do not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. Seems to be getting closer and closer there to Jesus Christ. Set my face like flint. I hope I'm not going too fast for you. Yeah. You must be having a job keeping up. <laughs> this morning we're going to look at the fourth servant song. And you'll find that too. we're beginning in Isaiah chapter 52. Verse 13, and I'm going to read right through to the end of chapter 53. Isaiah 52, beginning of verse 13. And God says, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured, beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness, so he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. 
Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, and yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. And yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. We give thanks to God for his word. This fourth servant song is, of course, as you will have gathered longer than the others. It takes a whole chapter and a few verses beyond that as well. But I suspect uh, the words, or some of those words, are quite familiar to us. Indeed, I would guess that the verses that we find here in Isaiah chapter 53 are among some of the best known and best loved verses in the whole Old Testament, certainly for Christians. They're so full of meaning, they are so full of significance, uh, but there's no way this morning that we can cover everything that is there in Isaiah chapter 53. You can't do that in the space of just one sermon. What I want to do this morning is to draw out some of the main themes that we find there. I want to begin by saying this. Don't overlook the importance of the first three verses that I just read. Isaiah 52 verses 13 to 15. Verse 13 in particular is a very important verse. It says, See, my servant will act wisely, he will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. And what I think the writer is saying here is this, don't be deceived by appearances. Don't be too hasty in making judgments. The verses that follow that in Isaiah 53 include a description of suffering, extreme suffering. Setting aside for a while our usual leap straight to the crucifixion of Christ, just think about it in its own time. The language that is uh, put out for us here seems to be describing some terrible and disfiguring illness, such as leprosy. That's what it may well have meant for the people of Isaiah's time. A terrible illness, suffering like leprosy. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, it says. 
his form marred beyond human likeness. And then in 53 verse 3, and one from whom men hide their faces. That could be a description of some terrible disfiguring illness, extreme suffering. But here, in verse 13 of chapter 52, there's a warning. You're going to be in for a surprise, says the writer. You'll be shocked by what you see, but don't be deceived by appearances. Don't be too hasty in making judgments. And verse 15 of chapter 52 indicates that the shock waves will spread far and wide beyond the Jewish community. He will sprinkle many nations, it says. Now that word sprinkle is a sort of technical term that means it's to do with sacrifice or ritual washing. And what it means here is he will cleanse, he will purify many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. The expression today is what? God smites. Kings will be God smites. They'll be silent. They'll be amazed and speechless and lost for words because of this servant. Something new was going to be revealed. And Isaiah has already warned his listeners or readers to watch out for this something new. Back in Isaiah 43, forget the former things, he says. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Something new was going to be revealed. And these first three verses of this fourth servant song, 52, 13 to 15, warn us that we're about to discover a new understanding of suffering. Now in those days, many religions, including the Jewish faith, believed that suffering was divine punishment for wrongdoing. Even today, actually, instinctively, we feel that there's a connection between suffering and sin. We may not always realise it, but how many times have I heard in my pastoral work the question, what have I done to deserve this? That's a reflection, isn't it, of a connection that we feel between sin and suffering. We instinctively feel that there's a connection there. A few years ago, I was returning, actually it's over 20 years ago now, thinking about it, I was returning home from a, a family holiday in North Cornwall and we were driving along quite happily along the road towards Oak Hampton, a caravan behind us and suddenly we heard a bang and a hiss and a jolt and uh, stopped the car and uh, I got out and had a look around the caravan, everything was okay. I was expecting to find a flat tyre but both tyres seemed okay. And then I noticed the car was leaning over. It was an Austin ambassador and it was leaning over to one side and I uh, very quickly confirmed that the hydrogas system, as it was called, had collapsed on one side. The pipe, a pipe had burst, a hydraulic pipe, and there was green fluid forming a puddle on the floor. I called National Breakdown out, as they were called in those days, Green Flag these days, and they responded in their usual prompt way. They arrive usually, they say they'll give you £10 if they don't arrive within an hour, so they come after 59 minutes. Usually I called them out actually in January, it took an hour and a half, uh, at midnight kind of thing. But nevertheless, they came along, they loaded the car onto the breakdown truck, they attached the caravan to their tow bar. We continued on our journey back to Western Supermare, which is where we were living at the time. It was all going well. We were making good time. I was sitting there thinking of all the petrol. I was saving because we were using theirs now. And uh, then suddenly we were on the M5 near Taunton and the passive motorist started waving at the truck driver. This time the caravan tyre had burst. He carefully towed us off the motorway and he called out a tyre firm to come and fit a new tyre because I wasn't carrying a spare tyre for my caravan. And the reason I'm telling you this is this, the truck driver and the tyre fitter were standing there chatting together and the truck driver said, the green flag to national breakdown man said, he's a Baptist minister. He must have done something very naughty to be out in all this trouble. <laughs> well, it's a light-hearted illustration in a sense. But that's an indication again, isn't it, that there's this feeling that there's a connection between sin and suffering. We find it in the book of Job. Remember Job had lost everything in one disaster 
after another his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep and servants, camels, and then his sons and daughters. And then Job himself was afflicted with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head, we're told. And one of his friends, Eliphaz, comes along and he says, come on Job, admit it, you must have done something terrible. Or as the Bible puts it, who being innocent has ever perished? Where were the upright ever destroyed? Those who found <coughs> evil and those who sow trouble reap it. Come on Job, you must have done something terrible. It's that uh, instinctive assumption that there's a relationship between sin and suffering. And we have to acknowledge that the instinct is confirmed in Old Testament theology. God taught through his prophets that there is a connection between sin and suffering. Even in the New Testament there's a hint of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. And the bit that's often left out, if you ever read those verses, Paul says, that is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep, by which of course he means some of you have died. He's reflecting there a link between sin and suffering in the context of the Lord's Supper. But through the book of Job and in other places, and here in Isaiah chapter 53, we're taught that it's not a simple equation or a simple correlation between sin and suffering. It's not as simple as people think. The connection is sometimes more subtle, more complex. The Jews had failed to recognise this and they'd taken the idea of this connection to the extreme. And they assumed that anyone and everyone who was afflicted in any way, anybody who was suffering, whether it's disease or bereavement, financial loss or whatever it may be, they were receiving the just deserts, the wages of sin. 53 verse 4, we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. He must have sinned to be suffering in this way. And such a person would be an outcast because all suffering is viewed in the Old Testament as self-inflicted. We bring it on ourselves. Suffering, according to them, is the consequence of sin. And no sin was ever seen as being just a private matter. It affected, it infected the whole community. And so they took it upon themselves to punish the sinner. And in fact, to get rid, to exclude the sinner from their community. But remember the warning here, it's not as simple as that. Don't be deceived by appearances. Don't be too hasty in making judgments. Chapter 52, verse 13 says, The one whom you assume is being punished and suffering for his sins will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. That's language reminiscent of Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Isaiah died, what do you do for Isaiah? I was just thinking. <laughs> In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. And here my servant will be honoured, raised to the highest heights, raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Sinners are not honoured in this way. This person who is suffering can't be a sinner because he's raised and lifted up and highly exalted. So be warned, you're in for a surprise, says Isaiah. And the surprise is this, suffering can have a positive, redemptive purpose. And this is expressed most clearly in chapter 53, verses 4 to 6. Listen again as I read those verses. And notice the contrast, I'm sure you've come across this before, 
the contrast of pronouns between he and we, his and our. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We, all like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's a new concept of suffering there in Isaiah 53. This punishment was indeed sent by God, but they misunderstood it. There was in this suffering a connection between sin and suffering, but it wasn't the victim's sin that caused the suffering. In verse 5, by the way, there, he was pierced for our transgressions. That word pierced means pierced to death. And when it says crushed, it means crushed to death. That's what the original word means. Why? Not because of the servant sin and wrongdoing, but because of our sin. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Sin is about being lost. Why do we get lost? Sometimes I get lost in the car because the signposts aren't always as good as they should be. At least that's my excuse. Sometimes signposts run out just when you need them most. Here it's not because the signposts are faulty that we get lost. We get lost because somebody leads us astray. That woman on the sat now, for example, can sometimes lead us astray. I got in a right old mess in Rouen in France a few years ago. We knew the way on the sort of inner ring road there, because we've been that way three or four times before. But on this occasion, they were doing roadworks on the bridge over the River Seine, and so it was closed and there was a diversion. The problem was the sat -nav couldn't react quickly enough to the new instructions and the new way that we were going. It also involved three lanes of traffic that we were sitting in going along. And just to add to the excitement, I was towing the caravan again. Uh, and so it wasn't very easy to change lanes when you found yourself in the wrong one. And because we were pulling a caravan, the engine cooling water was getting hotter and hotter in the slow city conditions. We made it in the end, but we got a bit lost on the way because that sat nav woman was leading me astray. <laughs> That's not the case here in Isaiah 53. We, all like sheep, have gone astray. Sometimes we get lost in life because of our upbringing or schooling or our surroundings. That's not the case here. Each of us has turned to his own way. And we can't really blame anyone else. My wife, along with her brothers, was brought up in a strict Baptist household, strict Baptist parents. That's a whole denomination that's separate from the Baptist Union because we think we are not very sound in the Baptist Union. So they're almost like brethren with a very narrow outlook on life. My wife survived and came to Christ. Her brothers didn't, and they have a tendency to blame their strict upbringing. It was enough to put anyone off, they say. But they're now in their 60s. They're old enough to take their own decisions and to make their own mind up. They've had long enough to take responsibility for their own standing before God. As are those who, for example, blame a strict Catholic upbringing and the nuns at the school that they went to. Each of us has responsibility. Each of us has turned to his own way. And we can't really blame anyone else. There comes a time when we take responsibility for our own choices and our own decisions. See, the image here is not of a flock of sheep blindly following the leader or each other. It's a scattered flock. Scattered because each of them, each of those sheep, as it were, has chosen to go its own way. <coughs> it's about personal sin. It's about our own responsibility. We can't shift the blame to anyone else. Notice also that sin is never to be taken lightly. 
He was pierced to death for our transgressions, those weaknesses and failings that we so easily dismiss. He was pierced to death for our transgressions. He was crushed to death for our iniquities. There's an insight there into the seriousness of sin. And so we have this new concept of suffering that says that one person's suffering may be the consequence of someone else's sin. That was something quite new to those Jews at the time. Perhaps we might say, well, that's not, nothing, that's not new to us. We can think of all kinds of examples where one person's suffering is a consequence of someone else's sin. We think of that in families where there's abuse. Sometimes one suffers because of somebody else's sin. If we mess with the environment, other people will suffer. We drink excessively and then get into a car and drive it. Someone else will suffer and perhaps be killed. Even our greed and materialism here in the Western world causes suffering in other parts of the world. So we can see that some suffering is a result of someone else's actions, but it goes deeper here. The servant's suffering is not just the result of people's thoughtlessness or negligence. What's new here is that the servant's suffering has a purpose. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. There's a purpose. And by his wounds, we are healed. There's a purpose in this suffering. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He bore the sin of many. Suffering with a purpose. Now that really was something new for the people of Isaiah's time. And it certainly wasn't at all like the old sacrificial system. Previously, the punishment fell on bulls and lambs and goats. Here, it's a human sacrifice. But there's a more important difference here. In Old Testament sacrifices, man chose and provided the victim. Here, God chooses and provides the sacrifice. In Old Testament sacrifices, the victim is not a volunteer, has no choice in the matter. Here, we have a voluntary self-offering. He poured out his life unto death. If there was some confusion about the identity of the servant before this, there would have now been an immense problem for the Jews. Because it rules out the nation of Israel. It rules out the righteous remnant. It rules out every one of them. Why? Because we all, like sheep, each of us has sinned. The sacrificial victim had to be sinless. And no one was without sin at that time. And this is where in the fullness of time the candidate for the position of Lord's servant narrowed down to just one unique person. Someone who was accused of being a sinner because he mixed with sinners. Someone who was accused of being a blasphemer because he spoke about the truth about who he was. In reality, it was someone whose only crime was that he was more righteous and closer to ultimate truth than any of his accusers. Of course, as Christians, we can only think of one person who answers this description, Jesus Christ. Thinking back again to verse 13 of chapter 52, that very important verse, he will be raised and lifted up and exalted. Some see here hints of the cross and the resurrection and the ascension, quite right. We certainly find the passage helpful in understanding the meaning of Christ's life and death. In earlier chapters, the Lord's servant was described as having a purpose, an all-embracing missionary purpose, and Christ certainly fulfills that purpose. In those earlier chapters, God's will and purposes are achieved through costly and obedient self-sacrifice, and again, Jesus fits the bill perfectly. And we see also that the servant is vindicated, so that not only is he the suffering servant, but also the victorious servant. Verse 12, I will give him a portion, that means a place, among the great, <coughs> 
he will be highly exalted. These words I find perfectly and uniquely fit Jesus Christ. But it's not meant to end there. Because to some extent in these servant songs we see what God wants to do and what can God can do through those who are willing now, today, to be his servants. That means you and me. We now are called to take on the role of the Lord's servants. To some extent, these servant songs are songs or should be songs about us. God's word challenges us to be this kind of servant. Not that we could ever uh, replace or repeat that full final sacrifice of Jesus Christ, but we are called to be the Lord's servant. God's word challenges us to be the kind of servant, this kind of servant, so that we too can be channels of God's grace and peace and healing in today's world, beginning here on the doorstep, but also extending throughout the world. God's word challenges us to share in God's all-embracing missionary purpose. It challenges us to be a light to the nations, showing all people near and far what it means to have Jesus at the centre of our lives and of our living. God's word challenges us to give ourselves, to pour out our lives in costly, faithful, obedient service. Each week I receive an email from the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity. That along with the Evangelical Alliance come on called Friday Night Theology. And they come on a Friday and they're quite useful. If you're going out on a Friday evening, for example, it gives you something to think about, feed into the conversation that you might have with non-Christian friends. But this week, the email came from somebody who works for them called Rachel Dean. It's called Connecting with Culture. And what she said, among other things, was this. And I close with this. She said, my desire is to live a life which demonstrates Jesus in such a way that people want to prepare to meet their maker in the now and in the after. As Christians, is it not after all our mission to declare to a broken world the good news of Jesus and the glorious gift of life that he brings? Living a life which demonstrates Jesus in such a way that people want to prepare to meet their maker now and in the hereafter. That's what it means to be the Lord's servant. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there you are. Thank you very much, Wade. We're just going to finish just by singing. Um, Chorus, and some we've not sung for years actually. Uh, we'll just stand together and sing. Shall we stand? Could someone just put the words on the overhead for us, please? It's a lost Christmas. This is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to follow him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. Just sing that for us together.
sick of the Holy Spirit, be with us all.